All right, welcome back. We are uh, doing another Dark Horse panel here at the Contrarians. Uh, we are talking about Black Sabbath today, and we are talking about the album Seventh Star. Uh, so, first things first, if uh, if you like the content, please uh, please do give a like. Uh, you can subscribe if you want to see more. Uh, please share with friends if you have like minded friends, uh, family who who want to join in as a conversation. And speaking of the conversation, please let us know what you think in the comments. That's always the uh, the second panel after the panel discussion. So, with all that stuff out of the way, uh, actually there is also a T Public. Uh, Patreon, uh, Kofi, their uh, links for all those things are in the description. So please check that out if you uh, would like. Um, <clears throat> anyways, enough of that. Uh, we've got a great panel here today. So we're going to go around and each of them is going to give a rating out of 10. And at the end, we will see whether uh, this Dark Horse album has, uh, has passed or not uh, from this panel. I have a little bit of uh, research here. And we're just going to go over some basic foundational info and then we'll dive right in. So Seven Star is a 12th studio album by English heavy metal band, Black Sabbath. Released in January 1986, it features uh, founding guitarist Tony Iommi alongside musicians uh, Jeff Nichols, Eric Singer, and David Spitz uh, playing keyboard, drums, and bass respectively, and uh, Glenn Hughes, the ex-Deep Purple bassist and vocalist as lead singer. So this should be an interesting discussion. We have some classic Dark Horse uh, themes here, you know, studio pressure, new vocalist. Uh, I'm sure our panelists will get into all that stuff. Martin has some some fun facts uh, about this as well. So without further ado, we're just going to dive right in. Uh, Martin, I'm going to throw it over to you to uh, tell the audience a bit more about this album and give your review. Yeah, okay. So I'll add a couple of things. So yeah, January 28th, 86. It wasn't particularly successful. Number 78 on Billboard. So I guess it did kind of okay. Um, no Stranger to Love. They, they made a nice video for that. Um, but yeah, this was a period when... Um, you know, they had lost Geezer and they had lost Bill and, you know, well, you know, Bev Bevan was was on the previous. So so there was a bunch of lineup changes uh, at this point. They they uh, they tried out some guys, David Donato and uh, Jeff Van Holt and uh, and who is it? Ron Keel, um, or, or at least they were in the discussion kind of thing for this. Um, it was uh, at one point going to be uh, an album where Tony was going to have like maybe 10 different singers singing uh singing on a solo album um so uh they, they it ended up being glenn hughes on uh, on everything tony had a predilection where he was saying at one point um you know i kind of want an english singer on on this thing um you know someone i can get along with kind of thing um but yeah so so they got finished and it was glenn hughes and then the label basically said well we don't want you want you to put this out as a solo as a solo album you know do you do you guys want to be playing clubs and theaters or do you want to you know have a shot anyways at at playing playing stadium you know arenas stadiums whatever like bigger venues and so uh it was kind of in everybody's interest uh to turn this around and turn it into a black sabbath situation it did say black sabbath featuring tony iomi on it um but uh but at that point, you know, Glenn was pretty horrified at the whole thing. Like, number one, he had a big coke habit. Producer Jeff Glicksman had a drug habit as well. Tony and Jeff Nichols were doing doing coke. Uh, so this is kind of their big coke album. Um, but Glenn Hughes, you know, didn't think he was going to be part of a Black Sabbath situation. Um, one night he went on a bender with uh, with the... Um, I guess a uh, road manager, production manager, something, John Downing, and they, they got into a fight and Glenn wanted more Coke and Downing punched him and, uh, and he, and he fractured his eye socket and he had a bunch of blood and mucus going down into his throat and all this stuff. So this comp, uh, uh, complicated matters, uh, when they went out to, to try play live on this. So number one, Glenn didn't, Glenn didn't really want to be part of black Sabbath. He didn't, he, he already was, uh, was like uh, overweight and he had the coke problem apparently he was like over 200 pounds um and now all of a sudden he's the lead singer of black sabbath playing bigger venues doing all these doomy songs that he didn't didn't really want to do um so he was uh you know he had a bit of a confidence problem anyways at this point but with this uh with this big pretty heavy duty injury happening to his face uh he only lasted five gigs and then they eventually got in ray gillen for a brief amount of time and uh and um the the reissue of the album the 2010 i guess it is reissue there's a there's a live set with ray gillen singing uh you know Aussie songs, Dio songs, and a few songs uh, from this album as well, which sounds fine. And the sound actually isn't very good. It doesn't sound very fine, but, uh, but yeah, so that's a little bit of the background. Um, 
you know, uh, basically the, the credits to the album read Anthony Iomi for everything. Um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, I would say most of the lyrics I've got, I, I took a quick look. Of course, I did this Born Again Black Sabbath in the 80s and 90s book. I got 15 pages on it in here. I, I took a quick look at it again. But and basically, it seems like uh, Glenn probably did more than half of the lyrics. Jeff Nichols, pretty involved in the lyrics. Tony got a little involved in the lyrics. Even producer Jeff Glicksman got a little involved in the lyrics. Um, Glenn Hughes didn't get along with Jeff Glicksman. He thought he was like a sort of a gossip monger and pitting Tony against Glenn and all this. But those guys, you know, were and and Jeff Glicksman, as I was saying, you know, he had his own drug problems. He's an Atlanta based guy. He's famous for Kansas. Um, and then he did he did Saxon, right? He didn't he do. Uh, yeah, he did Power and the Glory, right? Did an amazing job on Power and the Glory. But um, so so part of the album was recorded at Cherokee in L.A. Part of the album was recorded at Cheshire, whatever it's called, in, in Atlanta, I guess. Um, but uh, I, I thought I, I I didn't I didn't notice this. I just vaguely remember this. But didn't didn't they even do some of this at uh, at uh, uh, Compass Point in Nassau? Um, although I don't see it listed anywhere. I, I don't know. I, I thought they were kind of all over the place uh, with with this record. They were all little bits and pieces all over the place. Maybe you know what I'm thinking. I think I think I'm thinking of Eternal Idol with the Bob Daisley in and out and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I I believe that's it. But um, but yeah, so that so they came up with this record. Um, you know, you know what? Why don't I stop there and you come back to me and, and I'll do my little rating of the record. I, I mean, I don't I don't want to be the guy who talks and says everything. So uh, so come back <laughs> to me and, and I'll go through my review. I'll, I'll, I'll just for now be uh, be Mr. Uh, extra background. All right. Uh, I like it. We we uh, we will get the best of both worlds uh, first and last. Uh, all right. I'm going to throw over to uh, Sean. Uh, so if uh, you could uh, give a little introduction uh, before you give your uh, review, uh, that'd be that'd be great. So over to you, sure. Okay. Well, I guess I'm on now. Um, I'm new to this. Be gentle. <laughs> Good I, I did a video awesome. with uh, with um, oh, all of a sudden I'm forgetting his name, Jamie Laszlo, on the uh, uh, physical media site that he's got. Anywho. Uh, my day job is I actually teach high school physics of all things. <laughs> and uh, about to do my 20th year of that here in uh, East Texas. So uh, nice. I'll point out, hey, that this is sort of Black Sabbath because uh, this group has a song called Sabbath on Cornbread. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. I don't take up too much time. Let's see. Uh, well, I, I'm i new to the um, post uh, Aussie Sabbath. I hadn't really ever heard much of that before. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was off of Sea of Tranquility, uh, one of their rankings or something. I I ended up buying, um, started getting into the, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember. But the I got bought the Headless Cross. I was trying to remember the name of the guy that was the singer on that. Uh, Tony but, Martin. Uh, that, there you go. I even bought that album, His Thorns, that came out this year. Pretty, uh, pretty decent. Um, and so I started getting into it, and actually uh, – uh, I don't own this one yet. I'm I'm looking for it, but uh, you know it's not that bad. I, I just need to be willing to pull the trigger on a thirty-five dollar CD, I guess. But anyhow, um, so I went on on the oldie YouTube's there, and I, I spun it, uh, and I include and I also watched that uh, cheesy uh, video for uh, No Stranger to Love. So uh, got to see what happened. That's evidently what was going on with Tasha Yar before she uh, went to the Star Trek uh, Enterprise. There, she was she was involved with the Rottweiler and uh, and a odd looking Tony Iommi before that. But anyhow, uh, let's see. As I look over my notes, it got better the second time I heard it. Actually, the first time I was a little bit jarring. I was like, "Is this Black Sabbath?" I don't know <laughs> if you know if you took the name off of it. It's like the lost, long lost Dawkins album, or something, or, or uh, it's like what what Dio might have if he'd stayed with the band. Maybe it'd been another, you know, would have been a, a or rather it would have been something Dio would have put out maybe about this time. Um, that being said, though, uh, and also in like, I never really knew of Glenn Hughes. I'm a newbie there. I remember seeing him like at that metal show. Oh know, yeah, he, uh, he would be yeah. in the face and interviewed and stuff. 
and uh, I bought his Black Country Communion albums after that, and I uh, I got that last uh, Dead Day Disease record that he's on. Yep. And granted, 30-some-odd years is a lot of time, and he had a lot of drugs and whatnot, but he sounds as good as ever, evidently. But, uh, boy, the him in that video was like, who is this? This looks like Kenny Loggins or something. <laughs> <laughs> I had to look up. I, I looked up a picture of Glenn Hughes, 1986, and they say that's him. But uh, I'm like, that's not the black-haired guy with the glasses that's clean-shaven that's in Dead Davies. Really? But anyhow, um, oddly enough, his voice is held up over all that. Uh, anyhow, as I listen to it again, like I say, the first time was jarring. I'm looking at some basic notes here. Uh, just briefly, it it's actually pretty good. It's a good, like, mid-'80s you know, kind of polished metal record. Like I say, I don't know if it's a Black Sabbath record necessarily, but I guess it is their names on it. But um, the solos are great. Um, I like I like the sheen to it. Like you can, you can kind of hear the money. I guess there was some money still in. It wasn't like recorded in someone's basement, I don't think. Yeah. Um, some good ones like uh, Danger Zone has a good riff and a decent solo. Uh, Seven Star, I even wrote, like, this is Glenn Hughes singing Holy Diver, <laughs> which uh, it worked. I was I was digging it. Um, let's see. In for the Kills. The first three tracks are really good. Uh, In for the Kill. I mean, people have heard hate on No Stranger to Love, but I came into it uh, new, so I wasn't biased, I guess. And uh, I actually like it, you know, but then I've, I'm uh, unsympathetically or whatever, I I have a bunch of like 80s, uh, whatever you want to call them, glam, hair metal, whatever the the yeah. preferred term is. I mean, I've, I've got all the Cinderella albums and and uh, all the Rad albums. And secretly, I'm one of the guys that likes Detonator. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I don't mind a, a ballad every now and then like that. And, uh, it it worked. I dug it. The, again, the video is, is uh, mid-80s terrible, but uh, weren't they all, I guess. Uh, let's see. Um, some of those were, yeah, Heart Like a Wheel's good. It's like, it gets very bluesy. I, I wrote down that it, it reminded me of uh, a House of Broken Love by Great White <laughs> or something like that, or maybe something White Snake would have put out right about this time. Uh, maybe something off that 87 album. Angry Heart. The, uh, not bad. Um, again, that reminded me, I wrote down that it reminded me of a, a Survivor song or something. It wasn't just the title. It was, uh, you know, it had that kind of, I could see it in a Rocky movie or something where secretly he's, he's come back to finish off Ivan Drago's cousin or something. But, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, on the second listen, it, it was even better than the first time. The first time was a little jarring, but, um. Uh, it was good. Let's see. Uh, as far as like a seven out of ten ranking, hmm, I don't know. Maybe it's too generous, but uh, you know, seven out of ten. I think uh, I liked it. I th I'm gonna go look up a copy of it, try to buy it. Hopefully, one that's like new. I'll make sure they get their money. <laughs> cool. <laughs> if there's one floating around. Sensible grade. All right. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Thanks, John. Uh, great day. Great debut. <laughs> Uh, all right, we're gonna go over to uh, Bill next. So, uh, Bill, uh, let's see, let's see if the Dark Horse album uh, wins the race. There you go. There's a pun. All yours. Thank you, Nick. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Bill. You've seen me on a couple here already so far. I'm, I was right where you are, Sean, just a few weeks ago. I get it. That first time's a little nerve wracking. And this is my first topic. I want to poll. So. That added a little extra nerves on for me today, but I'm a lot more relaxed than I was previously, so it's cool. I appreciated the comment about the uh, Survivor Rocky theme because I'd never really thought that about Heart Like a Wheel before, but as soon as you said that, I heard the riff in my head, and I said, oh, yeah, absolutely, that would work. So now I'm not going to be able to unhear that. Thank you very much. Um, um, this album to me has a personal connection. It's a... Uh, 
the song No Stranger to Love that has the uh, line, living on the streets, no stranger to love. In 1986, I was living on the streets. I was homeless in Denver, Colorado, in and out. And uh, when I had the ability to play this album when it was new, that song resonated with me greatly, of course, just for that reason. So I'm kind of biased regarding No Stranger to Love to begin with. Um, but to go back to the start of the album, In for the Kill, the first thing I think when I hear the beginning of the album is Eric Singer. I love those drums. My wife and I have been discussing this the last few days. She's actually a trained musician. I am not, so she hears things much differently than I do. She thinks the drums sounded muffled. To me, they really pop and kick. They just come on strong at the beginning of In for the Kill. And I think uh, Eric Singer is... Uh, his parts seem simple throughout the album, but he adds just enough to keep me interested. I compared to a few other 80s albums of that general genre, some ACDC and Def Leppard and the sort of things like that. And most of the drum parts on those albums I found boring, just plodding and simple. With Eric's performance on this, I didn't feel that way at all. I think it helps to listen to it on the right equipment, too. I tried it on some little... Uh, bone conduction headphones and that sounded horrible but with a good mp3 file or a flak file or whatever and good headphones yeah those drums just pop right out um the other two fast songs danger zone and turn to stone we have these generic titles for all three songs there's probably a dozen songs at least by every one of those titles in the hard rock and metal world but i'm not here for originality uh this was my first Sabbath album, so I didn't really argue whether that featuring Tony Iommi in the, the uh, title ever meant anything. I didn't find out the drama surrounding that for many years later. So to me, this this was Sabbath. About the only ones I'd heard previously were probably the first three at that point. And Tony Iommi, to me, will always be Black Sabbath. He's the heart and soul of the band. He kept them going through the rough times in the 70s and obviously the only one through the 80s and beyond. That said, I agree with Martin. Sabotage is by far the best Sabbath album. If I'm trying to look at it objectively, I love that album. So I'm not going to claim that this, just because I wanted this to be a Dark Horse album, I'm not going to say this is the best Sabbath album. I will say it's the best Iommi solo album. And a good part of that is because of the singer. Glenn Hughes is, uh, yeah, exactly what Sean was talking about. He still sounds great. Um, I had no idea who Glenn Hughes was at the time because even though I was into a lot of classic rock and hard rock and metal stuff in the 80s coming up, I I wasn't a huge Deep Purple fan. I didn't really know anything about Trapeze. So what Deep Purple I knew is what I heard on the radio, basically. And of course, I didn't hear Burn or Stormbringer on the radio. So for many years, this was my only exposure to Glenn Hughes. Basically, believe it or not, until the Black Country Communion debut came out. I just happened to see that in a store right after it was released. And I said, Glenn Hughes. Oh, wow. Hey, and I recognized a couple of these other guys, too. I recognized Derek. I recognized Jason. I didn't know Joe Bonamassa at the time, but Glenn Hughes was enough to sell me on that, and I bought every one of their albums since. And, yeah, his voice sounds different, but still amazing. My son almost got disowned the other day because we were discussing this upcoming show, and he said, eh, Seven Star, meh, Glenn Hughes is fine if you like soulless vocalists. Is this my son? What? I thought I raised you better than that, son. <laughs> I mean, as far as white boy, hard rock metal singers, Glenn Hughes is the epitome of soul. I'm putting that out there. Yeah. I'm sure somebody will argue with it because this is the contrarians, and that is kind of the point. I'm especially looking forward to what Andy has to say because he pretty well dissected uh, somewhere in time when we did that a few weeks ago, and I'm still recovering from that. So. <laughs> um, moving on throughout the album, I think uh, Seven Star itself and its little intro, Sphinx, um, I think it's my least favorite song on the album. And it's the most Sabbath-like song. Mm. It seems like just anecdotal evidence, a lot of hardcore Sabbath fans think that is the best song on the album. 
and maybe because this wasn't really meant to be a Sabbath album, that's why it kind of sticks out to me and doesn't fit as well as the others. I'm going at it looking at this mid-80s Tony Iommi album with some amazing players on it. And uh, so I enjoy it, but it's definitely the bottom of the, the pole for me. Mm. The uh, Yeah, the final three songs I look at as a trilogy. I think they're all connected. Obviously, the last two are very much uh, seamlessly one transitions into the other, but it seems like a uh, three-part three part story of a breakup in the aftermath. And Glenn, yeah, wow. His vocals on that are awesome. I don't know. I mean, obviously, he was coked out. He was in bad shape, but it did not hurt his vocal performance at all, I don't think. Um, I looked... Of all places to uh, compare, I went somewhere different. I went to Prague Archives, which is a progressive rock review site. And they have Sabbath in as like a prog related band. They count 20 studio albums, including Heaven and Hell's The Devil You Know. The only one rated lower than Seven Star is Forbidden. So that's kind of where those folks are coming from. I'm not sure. I'm usually here at rank near the bottom, maybe not quite that low. But I was kind of stunned by that. I understand it's the progressive rock crowd there, so this is not necessarily what they're looking for, but I still was a little taken aback by that. Mm. Mm. If I try to put aside my personal love of this album and my history with it, I will try to objectively give it a 7.5. If in my heart, I'm giving it a 10 because I just love this album, but yeah, 7.5 is what I'm going to roll with realistically. Nice. Cool. Awesome. I like that you, you gave the uh, your, your objective review and uh, and the, that heart review. That's nice. I was, I was going to ask what you would, uh, you know, <laughs> rate it uh, unobje- <laughs> uh, subjectively. But, uh, I know I have awesome. some pretty cheap taste in some areas. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Bill. Uh, we're going to go over to uh, Andy next. So uh, we're, uh, we're uh, eagerly awaiting your review. All right. Well, uh, I like this album. I've always liked this album. And I think the key to enjoying it is to not go in expecting a Black Sabbath album. I think we all know that. I think what's interesting, though, is that we we sort of give this album a pass for being a Tony Iommi solo effort. Um, But then we sort of treat the subsequent Black Sabbath albums as Black Sabbath albums when they're really not that different from seventh star right it's tony and some other guys um some really good journeyman musicians um so i think that's kind of interesting i don't know if he knew it at the time but he was kind of creating a template with this album for black sabbath going forward which is really it's a tony iomi solo project um so uh yeah going into it with your expectations uh set where they should be. I think it's a really good, well-recorded, well-arranged, pretty well-written mid-80s metal album. I think it's a pretty middle-of-the-road metal album when you think about what else was happening in 1986. You had like, you know, it was like the banner year for thrash. It was also like a banner year for hair metal. And this is really neither one. Um, and, and, And it doesn't, it, it doesn't really invoke anything particularly Sabbathy. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't, uh, Tony doesn't call upon the flat five interval too much. So um, it's a kind of friendly type of Black Sabbath sound here. It's, it's uh, you know, still minor keys, but uh, uh, um, pre- pretty user friendly stuff. So I think the, um, you know, the production is sort of firmly 80s, but it's not egregious. I think, you know, you have the gated reverb on the drums. You know, every snare beat is like this wide. The guitar has a lot of sauce on it, you know, but it's pretty good, I think. I, I, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't really complain about any of those things. To me, this album is all about two people. It's about Tony and Glenn. The rhythm section, they're fine. Uh, they kind of stay out of the way. They're good players muscular they do the right thing for the songs but uh man hearing glenn hughes 
uh, seeing even in his adult state is is pretty wondrous. It's kind of interesting to put this up against Ozzy's record that he put out in 86, um, The Ultimate Sin, because he's pretty, I, I would say he's kind of phoning in his vocals on that record. He sounds a little tired, a little uh, uncommitted, let's say. And Glenn Hughes, for whatever kind of state he was in, he is crushing it on this record. And Tony Iommi, um, one of the most consistent guitar players of all time. Uh, you know, he always has this thing. I, I would say this about a lot of guitar players that kind of made their bones in the 70s, this spirit of um, spontaneity. Uh, Alex Lifeson is another guitar player who's like that. Um, and I love Tony for the fact that he never succumbed to the vulgarity of the 80s. You know, he never tried to shred um, he never played neon colored pointy guitars or, you know, um, you know, try, tried to keep up with with all the uh, the young um, post Van Halen shredders of the time. He always just kind of stayed on his path and um, he plays really super well all the time. I think that he always sounds consistently great and inspired and unpredictable. And on this album, he's very fluid and slippery and, uh, you know, uh, just he, he does his thing in such a unique way. Um, and uh, so that, those are the things that save some of the more middle of the road aspects of this this album. So I think the beginnings, uh, the opening song is um, sort of a, a triumphant, it was kind of like a, a battle cry type of song, kind of a power metal -y thing, really good, smartly arranged. I like No Stranger to Love. I always thought that the, the gothic doomy quality of the verses kind of um, offset the slightly more cheesy uh, aspect of the choruses, but I've, I've never really had a problem with that song. I always thought that um, you know, uh, Glenn just just saves it from um, being mediocre. Um, the title track is kind of a cashmere-ish type of tune. It's got kind of an exotic plotting character to it. Um, side note on the on the the uh, the keys in this this album: six out of the eight songs are in the key of A um, or A flat to be uh, exactly because they tune the guitars down a half step. So if you start feeling like things are sounding samey in the second half, it's because all the songs are in the same key. Um, so I think that there's a little bit of um, some, some kind of generic riffing going on in Danger Zone. <clears throat> but uh, I think uh, Angry Heart has kind of a cool vibe to it with those reverse swelling organ ramps in the verses which are kind of cool and i love how it just kind of segues right into um in memory and it sounds like it, it's kind of two parts of the same song um so uh what other comments do i have about this i think that's basically it i think it's just great to hear these guys sing and play i think the material you know, it's not the best material that Tony. I I think if you if you sort of put put this in the same line, uh, if, if you consider this to be of a piece with Tony's future collabs with Glenn Hughes, then it, it's it's kind of cool to look at it that way. I just think it's funny that that everybody discusses the Tony Martin era as if it's really different from this. To me, it's it's really similar. Um, I'd say maybe with Tony Martin, uh, Iomi is is kind of invoking more creepy and doomy sounding riffs a little bit. But um, I would say this is a, a real kind of strong uh, middle of the road heavy metal album performed by real journeymen, professional musicians with a, a good 80s production that's not egregiously 80s. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give this one, I'm going to give it a six out of 10. All with right. my compliments. Thank you. Cool. <laughs>
<laughs> awesome, awesome, super articulate uh, review there. That's uh, that's great. Um, it looks like we're sort of getting uh, a consensus middle of the road uh, going here. Uh, so we're gonna throw it over to Tyler before we go over to Martin, and then we'll see if we can shake things up or if we've got a uh, unanimous uh, opinion here. So Tyler, over to you. Yeah. All right. So uh, first of all, thank you guys for letting me back on to this panel. Um, I am very happy I didn't make too much of an ass of myself in the previous video that I was in. So, you know, so <laughs> so that's good to know. Um, but uh, a little bit about me. Um, I Music has been my life ever since before I can walk. Um, and the one band that did it for me was actually Aerosmith. And uh, my dad used to play them all the time in the car, still does. And they turn, quickly turned to one of my favorite bands of all time, still are to this day. But then since then, you know, I was really into classic stuff like Led Zeppelin, um, ACDC, Deep Purple, list goes on and on, then Lizzie. And uh, then I started getting into heavier stuff. And I uh, really started when I discovered Ozzy, I would say. I actually discovered Ozzy's solo project well before I discovered Black Sabbath. And um, so I was really grown up with albums like Blizzard of Oz, Diary of a Madman, Ultimate Sin, uh, No Rest for the Wicked, No More Tears, list, list goes on and on. But um, so I was a big Ozzy fanatic right when I heard them. Then I started really getting to bands like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest. Then I got really even heavier to the thrash stuff like Overkill, Testament, Megadeth. And then it just really spiraled out of control from there. But um, so when I discovered Black Sabbath, you know, I was a huge, huge Aussie fan. So I said, oh, she's in this little um, little obscure band called Black Sabbath. So so um, I started discovering the Aussie era of Sabbath. And uh, the first album I heard was Paranoid. And since then, you know, that album just got me like that. And then all of a sudden, I started listening to more of the Black Sabbath, Ozzy era, well, way more than the Ozzy solo stuff. And then now, as of right now, Black Sabbath is one of my favorite bands of all time. Um Uh, sorry guys, hold on. Oh, there we go. Am I good? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, you're coming through. All right, all right. So, um, yeah. So now, once I got into Black Sabbath, I obviously discovered the whole whole picture of Black Sabbath. So I really got into the Dio stuff really quick, and then I heard Born Again, the Ian Gillen record. Then I kind of just went in order. So I got this record, and then. There comes the Tony Martin era, and but I can honestly say I love all eras of Black Sabbath. They are one of my favorite bands of all time as of right now. They're definitely in my top ten. I'll just put it like that. So, uh, with all that being said, uh, what do I think of this record? So, um, Seventh Star. It's I am. I'll say this right now. I'm gonna be in sync with everybody here that's spoken. <laughs> it's very in the middle of the road for me. I wouldn't say it's top-notch Black Sabbath. You know, if I was to give an album to somebody who's never heard Black Sabbath, I, it definitely would not be Seventh Star. Because, I mean, and I'm everybody has said this so far, this is definitely the furthest thing from Black Sabbath. It doesn't sound like anything Black Sabbath has done prior to this or after this. It's just, it's very, very different. And the mix, so um, as far as the production goes, I'll just start with this. It's probably the most dated for me. It doesn't, it's the biggest issues I have with this record is the mix and the production. I just feel like the drums are very flat. Eric Singer's snares just sounds very, very flat to me. Even to, um, Tony Iommi's guitar sound, it just doesn't, it doesn't sound like it. It doesn't. When I put this on my turntable, it doesn't sound like you know Tony Iommi is coming out at me. If that makes sense, really. But so the mix, I just think is very, very flat. Uh, very just middle of the line. So that's mainly the biggest issues I have with this record. However, uh, when it comes to the actual songs, 
and the riffs and especially Glenn Hughes, I think this album really knocks it out of the park. I, as far as songwriting goes, as far as the, has Tony's riffs for the most part, I think are very, very good. So uh, if I get into the songs, a couple of my favorite tracks is the track that kicks off the record in for the kill. This is definitely probably arguably the heaviest on this record. Um, this is definitely probably the most Sabbath sounding, at least from what I hear on this record. But uh, the only thing is, like I said before, I just feel like Eric Singer's snare is very, very, very flat. Like it, the song opens up with that that uh, Eric Singer drum roll. I just it just doesn't sound right to me. But overall, I do like the song a lot. It's very heavy, very doomy at times. It's a great track. So that's definitely one of my favorites. Another one of my favorites is actually the title track, Seventh Star. There, There's that Tony Iommi riff again, you know? And those two are probably the biggest Sabbath-sounding songs on this record. And it's mainly due to those riffs, those Tony Iommi classic riffs that we all know and love. So that's definitely one of my favorites. Another one of my favorites, and I'm surprised actually nobody's mentioned it yet, at least I don't think uh, we have, but the track that closes the record, In Memory. I love this track. It's just a nice, moody, mellow track. Beautiful way to end this record. And I think the biggest highlight on In Memory is Glenn Hughes. I mean, Glenn Hughes sounds phenomenal all throughout this record. But In Memory, I think he really, really kicks it. This is definitely one of Glenn Hughes' best vocal performances, if you were to ask me. And I'm a big Glenn Hughes guy. You know, I love his stuff when he was in Deep Purple. I love Black Country Communion. Those albums rock. And I'm I'm a huge Glenn Hughes fan. I can honestly say this is definitely Glenn Hughes at his best, in my honest opinion, at least. So, yeah, those are three standouts for me. So, In For The Kill, the title track, Seventh Star, and In Memory. And uh, the rest of the songs, for the most part, are pretty good. Uh, Turn to Stone is a really good one that I like. Uh, you have Sphinx on here, which is kind of like a, um, kind of like a, just a little short little intro. Uh, you have Danger Zone on here, Heart Like a Wheel. I agree with everybody's opinions on that one. It's a nice little bluesy track. That's a really good one. Um, so, but the one track that I, I really just cannot get behind is No Stranger to Love. In my opinion, I, it just, it just sounds like a dated, dated ballad to me and it just doesn't do much for me at all i just i cringe at every time that chorus comes in it's just it's the most one of the most dated black sabbath songs you can ever hear if you were to ask me at least and i just i think tony is just kind of going through the motions on this particular track you know he's not he doesn't sound like anything tony i only would ever do he's just really going through the motions glenn hughes still sounds great on this track but I, I think the production really kills this track. And Tony Iommi, like I said, I think he's just really just kind of mellowing out on this track and th- not doing anything really interesting. So that's just the one track I really cannot get behind. But the rest of the album is either pretty good to really great. You know, so like I said, In For The Kill, Seventh Star, and In Memory are definitely my three favorites. So, um, if yeah, so that's... Uh, my quick rundown on this album uh, like i said before it's gonna be i'm gonna be with you guys i'm probably gonna give this a seven out of ten nice. so se- seven out of ten i'm pretty comfortable with that you know it is a good record it's not top-notch black sabbath but i can still put this on my turntable and have a pretty decent time with it yep. so yeah there you go seven out of ten black sabbath with seventh star nice there you go awesome all right. All right. Well, uh, we definitely have a consensus forming uh, here today. Uh, <laughs> yep. and, and thanks. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah. Uh, all right. Martin, uh, you, you've heard the rest of the panel. So uh, yeah. let's, let's get your thoughts on this. All right. Um, so first thing on, on the production, uh, I, I'm in, in agreement with bits and pieces of everything. I think this is a really good production. But as Andy says, it's not egregious in any bad directions in a huge way. It's just good, competent, muscular production, not particularly dated. Um, so, so that's fine with it as well. On this idea about being a solo album, I wouldn't want it to be a Tony solo album. I, I, 
I'd, I'd want it in order to be, give it a new band name or make it a Glenn Hughes solo album, but not a Tony solo album. I don't know. These guitarist solo albums, I'm, I'm just not crazy about the, the idea. It's like, if you're going to be, you know, make it a band, it would be really cool to have Tony have some other band that, that he was part of at some point. Um, mm. Andy, on your, on your point on how does it relate to what comes after, um, my favorite songs on here relate super favorably to Eternal Idol, which is by far and away my favorite of the later albums. And by the way, on production, I think Headless Cross sounds terrible. Um, that's one of the worst recordings Cozy Powell ever got. And I don't think Tear sounds very good either. Um, so I think this sounds better than both of those two. Um, you know, Eternal Idol is uh, about the same as this. Uh, Eternal Idol is actually even a little more modern and electro sounding, I think, than, than this album. Um, into the songs, I mean, I would say that... Um, Something bothers me about this album a little bit in that um, it it seems to address so many very disparate styles where I feel like on Eternal Idol, somehow those songs all sound like like a street gang together. You know, all those songs have this nice unifying sort of factor. Um, and Andy, I, I, I agree with you that, you know, it it is this is a template to what came after. That's kind of cool. But, um, you know, with Tony, you definitely get much more of a Dio singer and you get the more doomy stuff and you get uh, the, the more spooky, creepy Halloweeny lyrics uh, as well here and there. Right. So, so there are things pulling it both ways. Um, I really like on this record, the most danger zone, um, danger zone and, um, and turn to stone, I think have that sort of uh happy giddy semi Geronimo riff, but more of like a primary colored Geronimo riff style out of Tony. It's kind of a neat melodic thing, but I love Andy when, when you said that idea about him being spontaneous because he's not trying to be super flashy or impressive. It's just this cool Pete Townsend. -y, uh, you know, this, this is what I'm doing. I'm just having these chords that are sliding around all over the place. And that's, that's kind of neat about those songs in for the kills, a weird one. You know, I, I had a note somewhere that it was in seven ten, but I don't even think it is. I think it's more like 17, 10. It's, it, it's got like two separate parts that are, that are, are going at, at different, uh, different amounts, but it's almost like a drop beat or an ad beat sort of, sort of song. Um, not, not super crazy about it. No stranger to love. I'll agree with you guys that, um, yeah, it, when the chorus happens, it's a rote power ballad. Absolutely. But those verses are pretty doomy sounding. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, as, as Andy had mentioned, Sphinx is so quiet and you can barely hear what's going on in Sphinx seven star. I think, uh, I, I don't like Tony trying to like, he does, he does this on the, on the Tony Martin albums. I don't like, he just tries to be, tries to, tries too hard to be Tony Iommi or, or whatever. I mean, I, I just don't like the cashmere-ness of that one. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't buy into it being uh being a genius epic, put it that way. I, I buy into him, him trying to make a genius epic out of it. Um, and I like uh I think it was Bill, did you mention, or maybe it was Sean? One of you guys mentioned that I love that idea of the whole back half of the album, seven, eight, and nine, anyways, being like a trilogy. That's really cool. Heart like a wheel into angry heart into in memory. And yeah, definitely in memory, you you hear that neat transition. Uh, but but it's cool to think of all three of them together in an interesting way. I don't like heart like a wheel. I don't like a big, boring blues. Um Angry Hearts, pretty cool. Uh, and In Memories, a, a pretty cool mellow one, too, uh, as well. The idea there that the story goes around that Jeff Glixman wanted to be about his, his, his dog dying, but it's actually more about Tony's father dying. So there's that story to go with that one. Um, but yeah, so, so there's kind of my feel of it. I, I just, I really don't feel, uh, I don't, I'm not really feeling it like a Sabbath album. And obviously I think the reason we, we would, any of us would say that sensibly is that, you know, it's the only one with Glenn Hughes and Glenn Hughes is the least sounding Sabbath singer, uh, at least sounding even personality wise, I think to be part of this band out of, out of all the singers. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go six out of 10 on it. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Martin. So we have an average score of 6.7. So uh, I'm going to take a little liberty here. And uh, uh, after I make this statement, if you disagree, you know, stick your hand up and, and we, I want to hear from you. But uh, it seems that general consensus here is that uh, consensus here is that this is uh, a decent album. 
Uh, maybe it's not really Black Sabbath sounding. It's not bad. It's not the best album out there. So as a as a Dark Horse album goes, I'm going to say this this passes because we've I feel like everyone's saying they like it. It's just not, you know, a legendary album, an amazing album. Does anyone disagree with that? Uh, that well, sort of yeah, I, I'll just say statement? that I, I like that idea. And I, I think this was Andy that brought this up, that, that it, Tony's not trying to be a hair metal guy at all here or a shred or any of that. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So it's so it's fitting in. It's uh, it's a little more so on that commendable side than the ultimate sin and and maybe around the same place as Dio Sacred Heart, which is kind of a kind of an interesting way of looking at it. But but it's cool that, uh, you know, he just he just basically, uh, you know, right smack in the middle of all this stuff going on in metal and metal changing. He's kind of making a, a pretty traditional meat and potatoes, hard rock album, just not particularly Sabbathy, but but uh, but pretty much, uh, you know, pretty much like uh, like I would say, like a like a nascent early days hair metal album. It's a little bit more like a metal health or a rat. Uh, or maybe a twisted sister, uh, something you know, tooth and nail, just just something from it. it sounds it sounds a little more traditional back to 1983 or 1984. Yeah, I got a for me personally, I got a lot of flashbacks from the first don for from the first uh, docking record, breaking the chains. Yeah, that's that's what I would compare it to at least. Who else uh, compared it to a docking? Was it you, Bill, or was it uh, was it Sean? It was it was Sean, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, it's interesting. So we got we got two uh, uh two comparisons there. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go around and maybe put everyone on the spot here. Yes or no? Would you recommend this to uh, your most diehard? Uh, actually, no. Let's 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 say uh, just just to to in general, would you recommend this album, Sean? Yes or no? Recommended. Yes. All right, Bill. Yes. Andy? Yeah, I recommend it. For the guitar playing and the singing, I, if, if it's for a newcomer to Black Sabbath, I would say let this one kind of simmer and get into some other stuff first. All right. Uh, Tyler? Yeah, I would probably agree with uh, what Andy just said. If, if it's like uh, the first Sabbath record that it's probably not good if it's the first Sabbath record they ever heard. But with all that being said, I think I would recommend it. Yes. All right. And uh, Martin? I'll say no, because I hate records that have titles like black, you know, <laughs> band names called like Black Sabbath featuring Tony Iommi. So, so right, right there, it's uh, disqualified from being recommended. To anybody. <laughs> all right. Well, there, yeah. there you go. There's, uh, there's the panel's uh, consensus. We got an average score. Uh, I'm going to turn it over. Is there anything about this album that uh, anyone has a burning desire to to talk about, or anything that they, you feel we missed, anything interesting for the folks at home? Mm, I don't think so. I, I was thinking, I was just thinking about how this sort of harkens back to the early '80s metal. You know, when metal was starting to get really streamlined, but it wasn't going extremely in one direction or the other yet. Um, and how you know, in 1986, it's sort of like in no man's land because so much had changed you know since 1980 81 or whatever um you know what with the you know uprising of thrash and all this stuff and um and what would have set black sabbath apart from everybody in 1986 would be if they would have if tony would have like harnessed kind of the magic uh, quality of, of the 70s kind of more free, experimental, improvisational aspect of, of you know, those great albums, you know, Sabotage and things like that. Um, and, and the more loose quality of, of the musicianship uh, on those records. But all that stuff is jettisoned, you know, in, in, the, in the Black Sabbath of the 80s, it's just all gone. Like all, most of the metal bands just got rid of all those kind of vestiges of the 70s. So... You know, in the 80s, everything is just like this ACDC-ified arena-sized version of whatever they were. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a strange it's, it's an album that um, just kind of floats in the middle of nowhere in, in 1986. Yeah, hmm. sure. Yeah, well, yeah, go go for it, John. Well, dovetailing on what he said there that 
that popped in my head. I even looked up just out of curiosity, the albums that dropped in 86 and you know, you've got master of puppets by uh, Metallica. You've got look what the cat dragged in by uh, poison. So like a preeminent, you know, glam album and all this. And then where is, what is this album in that era? It's what does it fit into? What's the, what category is this? Uh, as briefly uh, on some Tyler said earlier, the popped in my head. Like I certainly wouldn't give this someone to someone as the debut uh, Black Sabbath because I can remember like the scary Black Sabbath when I very first heard on a Houston Texas uh, metal station like one in the morning. I heard like with all the lights off, you know, Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath, and it like scared the hell out of me. And it's hard to put that up against this, but nonetheless, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, I think, uh, I think we've, uh, like I said, we've, we've reached a consensus and, uh, we don't seem to have too much more uh, to say about this album. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll do the outro. So in general, just as a reminder, we got a 6.7, uh, panel rating on this one, uh, with most people, uh, recommending it, uh, but Martin does not. So keep that in mind. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank all of our panelists for being here today. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, as always, uh, a lot of, a lot of great stuff. Uh, and you know, I got, I got to learn a bunch. So thanks for that. Uh, for you at home. Thanks for watching. If you like the content, like we said at the beginning of the video, there's like, you can subscribe, 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 subscribe. You can share with your friends. Uh, there's Patreon, Kofi, T public, uh, all that good stuff is in the description, but most importantly, I want to thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Uh, please do let us know your thoughts on this album in the comments. Uh, the second discussion is always uh, tons of fun. Uh, so with all that, uh, thanks one last time and everyone have a great night, uh, day, morning, whatever it is for you. Have a go. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. See thanks, you guys. Later. Yeah. Bye now. Thanks.